because I have under one hour to deliver this presentation. So we will probably skip the practical part, but I hope like you will get the gist of um, what this um, talk is all about at the end. If you don't, you can send me personal emails or you can reach out to me in any other form on WhatsApp or so. So um, basically, um, my name is Shirifo Sise and I was also a UTG student back um, from 2006 to 2010, first bad computer science student. And I'm currently a senior research engineer at Huawei, Edinburgh Research Center. And um, apart from those boring details, I'm also the creator of BIT, which is one of the sponsors of, of Indaba. So you feel free to check our app if you have the time. So um, the objective of this talk is basically to understand um, the motivation of distributed data processing. And the second one is understand some of the key players in this area, which um, is Hadoop and Apache Spark. There are a lot of other tools, but these two, two are probably the kings in this area. And also to be able to write-, write Sorry, some, Dr. Yeah, be able to write basic Spark applications. I think um, after that, you'll have an idea and you can um, write more um, sophisticated um, applications. So basically, first, we need to understand what, what, the, what the problem statement is. So if you look at um, this diagram here, initially, we are mostly um, faced with um, data problems that can fit in our computers. So you have some small data set or it could be a huge data set and you can process everything within a server or within a laptop. But now with the advent of social media and digital um, world, you have so organizations and like social media companies, big tech companies, and even governments and, and, and organizations are faced with the huge challenge of storing and managing their data. So instead of kind of storing um data on one computer you can store this, this data in a distributed fashion and then you would then need a distributed programming model to access this kind of data sets because they are not stored on one computer so you will split this data into chunks and store part of the data on server one and store part of the data on server n and you have to have a distributed um, um, programming platform that you can use to um, access this data and process them in parallel so that would and uh, that would kind of enhance the speed of processing and it will not entail you to buy one beefy server which could be um, very expensive so initially computing problems are mainly about like cpu intensive workloads and cpu intensive workloads are workloads that would um uh that would put more pressure on the cpu and memory intensive workloads are workloads that would put more pressure on memory, but now we have data intensive workloads as well. These are workloads that are huge to process that are very difficult to, um, because of their size or because of the um, the, the speed that they, um, they are generated. For example, most of us are using WhatsApp and we are sending millions of messages maybe in a second. So how is Facebook dealing with such amount of data? How are they trying, how are they getting intelligence from that? So that's 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 kind of the motivation of why some of these tools had to be developed. So there are two key players in um, distributed data processing. You have the storage layer, which at the moment is mainly distributed file system. An example, or um, one of the first to emerge from this is Hadoop. So um, Hadoop is a stack. It has a programming model and it also has a uh, uh, a storage layer. So the storage layer is what we are going to focus on because the programming model is um, overtaken by Spark, I would say. So when you have data set, you kind of distribute this data set. Let's say it's a um, huge chunk of data set. You distribute this data set among um, nodes. So here you can see we have data node one, data node two, and data node three. And these colors that you're seeing here is just um, different chunks of data and you can see red in node one red in node two and then node three so you replicate this data chunk into different um nodes so this is the same data um data chunk and it's the same repeated here so you may wonder why are we uh, why 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 is the 
architecture design this way. So it's because of fault tolerance. So you want, so when this server is down, like when data node two is down, you can get this red um, data chunk from either node one or node two. So because most of these servers are commodity servers, they are not like um, high performance computing servers that would um, rarely break down, but these servers could go off at any time. So you need a way to um, replicate them. So once this server is down, you can get the data from one of these two nodes. And then the third one will be replicated to another node. So that's the storage layer. It's distributed. You chunk the data up and you distribute it in um, data nodes. And you have the name nodes here, which keeps track of where. So it's like a dictionary of where these data nodes are, are stored, which, um, uh, which block is stored on which node. So a secondary name name node is in case the um, primary name name node goes down, and you have a client on the left that interacts with this to um, send uh, to 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 put data in the distributed file system or pull data out. So um, few components in there. So and you have um, so if you have such kind of structure and you have clients interacting with it, so when clients send requests, there is something in between uh that is called the scheduler so the scheduler will decide where to put these nodes so if there are three nodes it will check the space on so basically it will check whether it can put this data on this particular node okay so that's what this schedule at a, at a very basic level like three thousand feet um, above so then you have um spark architecture which is the computing the compute engine that interacts with this data to um process it so spark has been growing quite um well over the years so let's start from um, bottom up so here is the storage layer so you can see hdfs is here hadoop is here but there are other um storage layers like key value stores or amazon s3 uh, you can use those ones now you have the resource management so resource management we have seen yarn and now you have kubernetes as well so some of you may um, hear about kubernetes i highly recommend uh, you to look into kubernetes if you are listening if you're interested in distributed system so is i think it has taken over all this um resource management so i i particularly work on kubernetes um at, at, at huawei at the moment so if you're interested in learning more about it you can you can you can let me know um so then you have the spark core and spark is made up of libraries and apis so libraries are lower abstraction um for example you have spark streaming which helps you to um process data that is currently coming in so for example if you send message to um if you send an image from one whatsapp um um client an example to another so may, so so before it reaches to the other person maybe whatsapp does something with with your image that maybe to reduce the size um or scale it down a bit so that kind of um processing may be called um streaming and you have Spark SQL. Some, so sometimes you can store some really um, structured data in HDFS or in the storage layer here. And you can use SQL to um, process this. And if you have some graph data that you've also stored here, you can do that. So machine learning as well. If you're doing some distributed kind of machine learning, I know machine learning has some special hardware like um, A100 and all these well-designed um, hardware for machine learning. But at the same time, you can use it like if your data cannot fit in in one server, you could use um, distributed data processing to 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 build your model. For example, um, uh, you may know Netflix. Netflix has so much data, and they normally use um, Spark to kind of do some of their recommendations. And APIs are just clients. So you can either use Scala, Python, Python R, or Java to interact with, um, uh, to do data processing. So in this talk today, I would be shifting between the presentation and the um, and the slides, uh, between the presentation and my terminal to show you some demonstrations of how we can use Python to interact with, um, to interact with the data stored in, uh, in, in our case, it's not HDFS, it's like a pseudo, distributed environment because everything is in one one node. So Apache Spark basically is a cluster programming platform. It is fast, general purpose, and unified platform for writing big data applications. So if you've ever 
um, thought about looking into big data. Spark is one of the technologies you would likely get into. And um, okay, so this is quite similar to what I've explained. So you have, so the way Spark works is you have some very low level APIs, but we are not going to deal with that. So we're going to use data frames and data frames are then translated to um, lower API. So data frame, if you've used um, uh, Pandas also, so it works similar. So if, because it's Python, so they make it um, similar to that. Um, so like I said, RDDs are resilient distributed data sets. They are the core of Spark. So you don't need to worry much about how RDDs work because you have an abstraction on top of RDDs that is data frames that you can use. But sometimes you may need to use RDDs to do more advanced <coughs> data manipulation. So data frames is what we're going to focus on more, <coughs> mostly. So it's the most popular um, structured API um, and <coughs> Data could be either structured or, or semi-structured. Um, structured means like you have a tabular, tabular kind of structure and semi-structured maybe um, JSON or XML or stuff like that. So, and, and these things are then compiled down to RDDs. So um, the data frame API is doing a huge work for you. So there are two major operations when working with data frames and these are called transformation and um, actions. So if you know about lazy approach in computer science, it's mostly when you have X number of operations that are just stored in memory and you have one operation that triggers those memory. So it's like you have a graph with um, several nodes and all those nodes so store some data points that needs to be calculated at the end. So transformations are just a bunch of a bunch of um, transformations that you want to apply to your data. For example, you can say read data, filter some information out, select some columns, show me the data. So if you say show me the data, that's the action. So the first three are transformations. So we will see some transformation and some actions um, soon. So, and there are two types of um, uh, transformation, narrow transformation and wide transformation. Um, I could go into explaining that, but due to the um, time limitation, I'll just um, go ahead. We'll see it in action. So Spark core contains basic functionality. So like I explained, Spark jobs are kind of organizing graphs. So DAGs are graphs that don't go back. So if you've done graphs, if you're in year four, year three, you may have done graphs in um, data structures and algorithms. So you can traverse graphs in several ways, but that DAGs are graphs that would only go in front. So you have transformations and actions at the end, and you cannot go back to say, okay, I want to do more again. So you have to save that data and do more um, transformation and actions on that. Um, so Spark, like I said, also have SQL, which you can use to work with structured data. So if you are more comfortable with SQL, then you could you could you could basically use SQL as well to um to interact with spark so it's a very robust um, um big data processing framework so streaming like i mentioned enable processing of live stream of data so you have some data coming into your server you want to intercept it when you get it and do some transformations and then display it on a website or store it in some um, final storage so it has some machine learning libraries as well um, where you can use classification, regression, um, unsupervised learning, recommendation, and deep learning. So um, for those of you um, interested in deep learning uh, at scale, you may also um, see how that is done in Spark. So graph support as well. So um, um, I'm not sure if the application is installed in in the computers there so Useno and um i think long local they were trying to do it but um, i'm not sure but nonetheless we can you can you can have a look at my screen and basically we can go through some of the examples together when we get to that point but to run spark all you have to do um fred you want to say something okay um so so to run Spark, all you have to do a uh, Pi Spark is for you to execute the Pi Spark binary, and there are two ways of doing this. When you execute the Pi Spark binary, you will be interacting with Spark interactively. 
So you will write commands and you will see um, results in action, just like when you're writing commands in your terminal. So, but in real life scenarios, you will submit a job to the cluster and there will be a scheduler, like I mentioned, Yarn scheduler or Kubernetes scheduler somewhere that will kind of try to um, allocate resources to process your um, job based on the amount of data you want to process, based on the number of parallelism you want. So, um, but in, in here, we can try both of them. They are all going to work, but it, it makes no sense to submit to um, a single cluster, or we will try um, all of them and see how it works in action. So, but how does Spark actually work? So basically uh, the way it, work, it works is you have a di driver program, which is like when you type Pi Spark or when you do Spark submit. So a driver program has a Spark session that communicates with a cluster manager like Yarn or Kubernetes, and then you have worker nodes here. So for example, your laptop would be your, like where you're submitting the job will be, will, will hold your driver program. And once you submit a job to the cluster manager then the cluster manager would submit these jobs and these jobs are going to be run in containers. And uh, these containers are called executors, which has their own memory and, um, and CPU binding. And your job may have one or more tasks that needs to be executed. So the, in, in most scenarios, so you will have um, tons of executors running in one node um, distributed across, across the cluster. So the thing is, this, these clusters are normally shared. So there are a lot of other um, um, employees or um, teams within the organization that will share the cluster. So therefore, there needs to be a cluster manager to say, hey, OK, um, I need to make sure everyone has a fair share of the cluster. So a very simple model. So every Spark application consists of a driver program and executor. So these are the two, two, two main um, components or two, uh, these are the two main applications of a um, Spark program. Um, and of course, once you do that, you'll, um, you'll have Spark context, XQL context, which is used for SQL, and you also have Hive context. Hive is SQL-like -like database. Um, you can use Hive queries just like most Hive, Hive queries are compatible with um, um, ANSI SQL queries. So once you enter the Spark shell, if you type Spark, then you would see something um, like this will give you, uh, which shows you that, okay, you have a Spark object loaded into your current session. So, um, but if you're writing a program, you want to have this Spark session in your Python program. So how would you do that? So you basically um, use this line. So you use the Spark session um, uh, class and then use call the builder um, then to build a Spark session. So here you have few main, um, you have few main objects that we can focus on. For example, the app name. So whenever you submit, an app to the cluster, you want to identify it with a name. And a master, in our case, we are using a local cluster, but if, you, uh, if we are using a local computer, so you can just put local here. But if you're using a cluster, then you have to put the address of that cluster here. So it's normally some IP address, colon, and some port. Uh, and then you do get or create, and you can have some configurations as well, the way you want um, to configure your um, Spark system. So we'll look at some of the ways that we can interact with the data frame, and then we will do more examples um, on, on, on movie lens data set. So you can create a data frame in several ways. Like you can create it using um, just code. So for example, um, this is just like the way Linux um, Python range works. So spark.range thousand will give you a range of numbers from zero to 999, I think. So that will be stored here in a data frame and the header is going to be number. So you can do operations on this, okay? And you can also use the create data frame function as in uh, as shown here. So you have an employee, a row, which is Jack, and um, the value is 24, you have Bobby, which is 26. 
and you create a data frame out of this employee object. Okay, so you have employee and these two here are the column names so that you would refer to these two when I'm trying to process this data set. So quite straightforward and, uh, and simple. So, but most of the time, what you would essentially do is not to create these data frames yourself. You have some bunch of data lying down there in your department and they came to you and say, okay, let's process this data. But you know, it cannot fit in a single node. You have a cluster in there then you can you can you can then use this um, approach to to read a file or read CSV. Right. So um, so the first one here is we're trying to read a CSV file. So all we do is spark read. So remember your Spark session already has this, so you don't need to do any importation. So Spark read format the format of the file you want to read is in CSV. And you load this data. I uh, you you call the load function with the name of the data file, okay? And it's um, similar here. You have more option where we can infer the schema through. So infer schema basically would assign data types to your column names. So if your column is a string, it will call it a string. It will treat it as a string. If it is an integer, it will treat it as an integer. So header true. So um, if your data frame has headers and you want to include them, if your file has headers and you want to include them, then you can use that. So in this example, we're going to read some CSVs and, 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 and do some data manipulation. So data frame, data sources, so many. So most of the common kind of um, uh, data sources are, are compatible with Spark. So CSV, JSON, um, ORC, Parquet, text file tables, JDBC. So with JDBC, you can connect to um, MySQL, you can connect to Postgres, you can connect to MongoDB, and you know, so it gives you a, a, a wealth of um, a wealth of options to um, read and write data to. So we talked about lazy evaluation. It's the process of Spark ignoring whatever you're typing, whatever transformation you're doing until you get to an action. So we'll see that. No need to waste much time on that. So here are some transformations. For example, um, um, a print schema would basically print the schema of your um, the file that you load. Load. So for example, if you load a CSV file and it has three um, columns, if you do print schema, then it is going to show you the schema of that um, data. So um, describe is also uh it shows you the columns so it it would basically do um some count mean standard deviation mean of a numeric column so for example you can do um, something like this so transformation as well so you have more transformations here where filter so if you have a data set and you filter um where value is greater than 100 percent uh, 100 and you can also do um, you can also filter out even num odd numbers or even numbers. So more transformation distant as in SQL query, just give me this um, value once and limit you want to limit um, something. Okay, and you can also use it for sorting. Sorting is quite a common operation um, wh whenever we're dealing with data. So you can sort the data and you can um, group them by, or you can order them by ascending order or descending order. Ah, oh, so you can also do um, sampling. So sometimes you do, in, especially in machine learning, you have um, a test set and a training set. So you want to kind of randomly select um, your training set so you can, um, you can do sampling um, um, with Spark. So you can also do aggregations. So aggregations are you group things together and then you count them, which is a very common operation in um, SQL. Uh, um, so min, max, average, first, last are all example of um, aggregation. So let's look at some of the actions. So what we have shown before are mostly um, transformations. So actions would 
trigger those transformations. So for example, if you call first or you call so, so, and um, so, n number of lines, or you want to take, um, take is similar to, so we'll see the difference, or you, or you call collect or you, or you call count. So these are saying, okay, I've done some transformation, now show me the results. So then Spark is going to go and start ex and start executing the DAG. You remember the DAG, the DAG? So, um, yeah. Okay, so this is an example. We'll skip that. I will, I will, I will run it later. And yeah, so now we can skip to um, examples and I will show you some of the um, examples that I've um, prepared. Um, that should be much better. So if you do Pi Spark, so Pi Spark will then load your Spark, um, your Spark session, as we've mentioned before. So you can see um, this is the latest stable version of Spark, and then this is the interactive session. So we could write, we could load some data, we could um, transform that data into, um, we could transform that data into some data format and then um, we do some data manipulation. So I would first of all show you, um, uh, sorry, let me have two screens. I'll split my screen into two. <clears throat> so here we'll have this box system here. Uh, and on the right hand side, we can have the. Uh, so here you can see that um, the files that I have, um, we'll go into CD later. So these are the files that we're going to um, look into. Okay. So on the left hand side here, uh, let's first start by um, loading, let's say the movies data set. So, so this is movies lens, it's an open source data set that um, is structured in CSV. So it has movies and it has the rating of movies. So for example, let's say you watch a movie, let's say Megamind and a thousand of people watch this movie and they will give it a rating. And then you can then um, calculate what's the average rating of this movie or what are some of the uh, movies in 1995 if you want to go back and watch some of the top movies. Okay, so um, uh, let's let's look at how we can load um, data. So I think um, we've seen, so this is, for example, movies is equal to, Spark, we have our Spark, so, and, if, and if you do um, tab, tab, it will show you some of the options you can, you can, you can use. And spark.read.csv. So here we're explicit, ex, explicitly saying that you want to read a CSV file, and then you have to provide the location of where this CSV file is. So all this, so if you type pi Spark, and you go online, you would see the um, Spy Spark API. So yes, so for example, data frame. So if you come here, you can teach yourself how to use all these um, functions. For example, we, data frame here, we can search for read. Oh, the, oh no, that's 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 the Spark system. But once we load the data, the data is in data frame, then we should be able to come back here and see um, what we can use. So let's go back here, read. Then the first argument is going to be, what do you want to read? So we, we can see that this is in ML exercises, um, ML latest data set, and then movies. So if you have any question, feel free to stop me um, in the middle of the talk. ML latest small and then movies dot 
csv so another option we want is header is equal to um true so it's python so you don't need to code this through because this is a python library and when we do this hopefully we have no um error messages so it should Yeah, it should read this data. So, um, so we just read movies dot lens into um, into this data frame. So we can do movies. For example, you want to see which of the which columns are there. Movies dot print schema. We can do movies dot print schema, and we can see that we've read this, and it is, it has movies, and it has which is a string, title, and genres. Mm -hmm. So we can go to the right part of the screen and then check um, head movies. So we can see movies has it has these titles and it's just a CSV file. Okay. So let's 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 inspect what is in this. So movies dot so we can have a look at the first couple of um, uh, first twenty lines. So you can see it's a movie ID identified by this, and we have a title, um, which is some strings, and we have genres. So movie genre could either be adventure, animated, children, romance, and so on and so forth, drama, and so on and so forth. So you once you have this, so if we had time, I would have given you an exercise to kind of do some analysis on this. But, I, but since we don't have time, we will do some of this analysis together. And you can go ahead and teach yourself if you're interested. So we can also, like, if we want to know how many um, columns are there or how many rows are there, the size of this data set. So we would do movies.count. Okay. Just like, um, so, so what we have done so far is mostly um, actions because whenever we execute this, it gives us an answer. So what we could have done is to do some transformations and then call an action. So transformation will be filter stops out. And let's do a few transformations. So st um, we still have our movies data set um, in memory. So we could do movies dot filter um, select, let's say select. Movies that select selection is quite um, common. So, for example, in SQL, we could say select star. So, select. Let's say we just want to see the titles. So, you can see here it just printed um, title string. So, if we want to see, so we could append. Yes, so we could append. So, so what we have done here, this is transformation. We were trying to transform our original um, data into um, another form. So here we did a transformation, and then we call show, which is an action, to show us um, the movies. So you can also use filtering. Um, you can, for example, say, give me all the movies uh well uh, give me a movie whose id is let's say 100 so that should be um we have a filter keyword for that filter and again filter so here we could use movies.data or we could use just like you would do in python like movies like that data that should also work so movies dot um movie id i think that's our yes that's our movie id is equal to equal to 53. so if you don't put a show there so that is going to do a transformation so this transformation, in fact, um, is going to do a transformation. And if you do movies.show, 
Right, so we need to put a show here. So we have um, movie 53, America 1994 and this. So we can do more advanced kind of um, um, filtering as well. There are, you can use PySpark SQL functions and then use those functions to um, extract whatever data um, you want to extract. Um, let's 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 kind of pull out all the movies that's have that have 1995 in their titles that's a more interesting one so we can filter as you may imagine so which column are we going to filter it's going to be the title column right so movies dot title um dot it's just a matter of looking at the API. I do not memorize these things. So whenever you want to do it, we look at the API and see how it's used. So um, this, we could go back to the API again. So if you click Control F, uh, contains, so data frame that contains, yeah, data frame that contains, I'm not sure if these are different contents one or more sources. Okay, it's not right. Okay, so data frame dot contains. So that should be a sub one. So it contains, let's say, nineteen ninety five. So movies that title that contains 1995 show. So that should this should only show us 1995 compared to the previous one. So if we don't have that, it would show us movies that are not 1995. Let's see whether there are some 2023 more. No, there are no 2023 movies in there. I don't think so. Uh, so let's say let's say 2000 probably would find some 2000 movies yes so there are some 2000 movies but here you can see that um we still have okay 2000 is here 2000 is here but this is this is a 1999 movie so if we were interested in actual 2000 movies we should have um done something like that so that it would match everything or use regular expressions um uh, to be to be to be so to be sure so. yeah okay and another one would probably be let's see how much time i have so i have about 11 minutes so 18 19. so another one would be for example let's look at this um data set again so we have titles and we have 1995 but wouldn't it be interesting if we want to create another column here called year that basically extract this 1995 or the movie year and put them here so that maybe we can do some more manipulations with the 1995 right now if you want to count how many movies are 1995 you could buy and do 1995, it's going to be difficult. So what you can do first is, okay, the movie year is embedded in the title. So let's extract that and have that as a last column here. So to do that, um, we have to do two things. First, we have to make use of um, SQL function. So it's called, um, so we have to um, import that, import by dot sql dot functions um and we want to kind of rename this function as let's say function f so that we can use this short name to call all spark sql functions so what we're doing here is essentially we are saying okay we want to use all pi spark sql functions in our data frame data processing so that that's very powerful so and then 
So if we type F and we can see that it's it's this module in um is this module. Okay. Um right. So now let's um let's do this. So now we can we can say we can create a new column by doing let's say data equal to so we keep the movies as it is, but we create a new data frame and then add a column to that. So we can say data is equal to movies, or we can just use the same to be honest. Movies is equal to movies dot with column. So um with column. Let's go back to our reference. If you search for with column, you can say with column clearly tells you that returns a new data frame by adding a column or replacing the existing column that has the same name. So that's that's quite powerful. So let's do that. So the syntax of this is um so you basically say the new column that you want you want here and then you in our case we try to extract the year let's say 1995 or 2000 from a particular column from the title column so we can do f dot um so you have to use this um reg x extract so reg x extract and what do we want to from which column do we want to extract from titles okay let me just increase okay so and then you have um so um you know regular expressions, right? You you may have done regular expressions if you are in year maybe two, three, or four. So backslash the false. So what this is essentially saying is anything enclosed in this um in these brackets, any any number enclosed in this bracket, one or more. So D means one or more digits. So one or more digits. And then we want to so if regular expressions, you can say I want to March zero. So control B. Sorry, control B. Control B. Yeah. So we want to march zero. So if we had this, if we had it repeated, so this would be zero. The repeated one would be one. So but since we have only one, we're saying okay. Whenever you see the first one, which is at index zero. So that should be the value that this year should be. Okay. So hopefully everything is right there. So you can see this is a transformation. It returns, uh, sorry, yeah, it's a transformation. It returns immediately. So we did not see any re results until when we do movies.take, um, let's say take 10. Okay, so that's the difference between take and take doesn't give you a very um, nice output. So we will just um, use show. So so as well, um, you can definitely say you want to show 10 or you want to show more. So now you can see our year is nicely added, 1995. And now we can use this new movie data set to say, okay, give me only the filter out the movies that are just um 199 let's say 2000 or 2001 or 2002 which would have been difficult without this so so the advantage um you may not appreciate the power of a distributed data processing because we are doing it on a very small data set on one computer but let's say this file is let's say um let's say 500 gigabyte which you cannot load in your memory. If you try to process even, let's say, one gigabyte of data, let's say 500 megabyte of data in your computer, your computer will seriously slow down. So talk less of, let's say, 5, 10, 20 gigabyte. So if you want to process that in our normal business or um, university computers, it's not going to work. So let's say this CSV file is a bunch of gig gigabytes. You can distribute it 
on various computers and you can use Apache Spark, write your code. So we are doing interactive processing at the moment, but normally all this code that I'm writing at the moment, you will obviously have to um, code them in, in your IDE and then you use Spark submit, which is then going to submit it to the cluster and do the processing. That is when you will appreciate how powerful Apache Spark is. Because right now you could tell me, oh yeah, I can do this in Java, or I can do this, um, I can write a Python program to do this, so I would not necessarily need um, um, Spark. So, but it's mainly for distributed processing. If you don't have heat data set, forget about Spark. So, um, so you can also do joins, for example, um, so for example, on the right hand side here, so we have- um, Sorry, Dr. C. Yes. B before you proceed, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so from, from what you basically uh, uh, presented, uh, mm -hmm. PySpark is mainly used for data manipulation, right? Data transformation. Where does Hadoop come in all of this? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, good question. So if you remember my, um, let me go back to my presentation. If you remember these diagrams here that I started with, the architecture diagrams. So if you remember this problem that we talked about, that should be a way of, so you have some big data set that cannot fit in your computer. It cannot fit in two computers. Maybe you need to distribute it over a hundred hundred of nodes. So how do you organize that? So that's where Hadoop comes in. So um, if you look at this here, at the storage layer, that's where you have HDFS. So Hadoop is a distributed file system. It used to have a programming model called MapReduce, but that's, like I said, it's overtaken by Spark. So what Hadoop helps you to do at the moment is store this data, this big data set that cannot fit in one or two or 10 of your computers in a distributed file system. So um, I can quickly pull up this HDFS and I can go to the Apache page. So uh, yeah, so this is this is HDFS. So it's, it's top level Apache project. It has always been um, so HDFS. Apache Hadoop, you can see it's one hour ago. That's the last comment. So it's 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 one of the top projects out there because it underpins the big data um, storage platforms. So you have Amazon S3, which is also a distributed um, uh, data storage and Microsoft has theirs, but this one is open source. You don't need to be, so if you want to build your own big data uh, infrastructure, you can use it. So to answer your question, Fred, um, HDFS is at a storage layer, but right now we are reading our data from desk because we don't need a distributed environment in our demo. But if you are actually setting this up for MRC, for example, you would need to have some form of a distributed um, environment um, for them. So if you have five servers in your cluster, how do you manage how to store your one terabyte of data? So you have to use a distributed file system. So it's just for storage. Hadoop is for storage, yeah. And Spark does the processing of that data. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. That's That answers it. Okay, cool. So now, Doctor. Uh, yeah. Before I, Usedu has a question quick. Before we so now, on. what what is the use of the Kubernetes and the uh, it is used oh, yeah. for handling the cluster? Yes. So so if if we go back here again, so we have Kubernetes here. So these are options. So you can either use stand alone, just like we're doing it at the moment, or you can use Hadoop Yarn. So Hadoop was developed together with Yarn, but now uh, you Mesos was used by Twitter, but Kubernetes is now like the the king in distributed processing okay so that so there, there, there are uh, movements trying to move let's say spark execution into kubernetes okay so you don't you don't actually need to um you don't actually need to have yarn so the the storage layer stays the same but this one is the resource management 
So if you have several computers, so many people are using them, you submit a job, Fred submits a job, and I submit a job, and they all need huge amount of memory. How would, so you need some mechanism in between to say, oh, I don't have this amount of um, uh, resources for you. So if we say any you wait, and Fred and Sirifo's job are going to run first. So that's what Kubernetes is for mostly, and that's what Yarn is for mostly. So, but the difference between Yarn and Kubernetes, Kubernetes is general purpose. That means it's not just designed for um, big data processing. Hadoop, uh, Hadoopian is designed mostly for big data processing, but Kubernetes is not that. Kubernetes, you can run microservices and you can also run your normal big data application. So it's, it's like one size fits all. So something like, so that is the main difference between um, Kubernetes and Hadoop. And that's where, so it's just, it's mainly for scheduling. So if you are on top here, you, you write your program in Python, you submit your job, Okay, let's say it's Spark streaming um, uh, problem or it's just data analytics. Then it will come to this resource managers and they will decide whether your job can be scheduled at the moment or your job has to wait. I hope that that answers your question. So uh, basically, so just, just to wrap up here because I'm almost out of time. Yeah, so just, just to wrap up here, we can also do joins. So if we have two tables and we want to um, do joins, it's, it's, it's quite straightforward as well. So you read your first data set. So I'll, I'll, I'll just put um, maybe some pseudo code or some instructions. I'll just type some in instructions here. Um, in fact, let me control Z set dollar uh, sign. No, no, no. Control. Okay, so I'll 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 write some stuff here. So um for example you have movies you have movies and you have so you want to join these two data sets because movies is just this movies data set as we have seen here and ratings are what's it rating for this so for 10,000 people they rate this movie with different um movie ratings zero to um let's say one to five star okay but you want to join these two so how do you, how do you do that so basically it's simple first is you read this as a data frame and you read this as a data frame as well. And then you you do the join. So to join, so you can say movies underscore rating is equal to um, movies dot join. And you want to join. So you know inner join in SQL is the same. Select star from students where um, uh, you select staff from the students and you want to see their marks in mathematics. You inner join them by the ID. So a student ID join with the um, their matriculation ID. So ratings, comma. So which one do you want to join on? So in our case, it would be OB ID. So once you do this, so you'll have these two tables joined and you have a more um, uh, more kind of connected data that you can um, do your processing on. So uh, you can do further reading here. Um, Apache Spark. Where is the, yeah. So Apache Spark here, this is Apache Spark. You can come here and read more about it if you are interested. And for Hadoop, if you want to know more about Hadoop as well, you can go to Apache Hadoop homepage. They, they should have a README um, somewhere where you can read more about um, Hadoop. So that, that should be um, here. 
So these are quite important um, big data processing uh, tools. Spark for sure is on top. Hadoop is just a storage layer and you can do a lot with it. You can do machine learning, distributed machine learning. You can do um, analytics, you can do graphs. So a whole lot of um, um, other, as you can see, a whole lot of other options. Um, so I know this talk is quite short. We should have um, had two hours, but because I, I'm, I'm, I, have, I have a plan to go somewhere and unfortunately I couldn't stay longer than this. So I hope you appreciate the um, short time that I've shared with you. And please do let me know if you have any question anytime. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm happy to um, answer. Any question, guys? Maybe we can clap for that this is. Any question? No? Dr. this is a thank you so much for your time. It's well appreciated. Actually, right. you, you really sparked my interest in in, in uh, uh, what, well, using PySpark and Hadoop now for good data processing. It's something I looked at, but not deeply. So at least this has sparked right. my interest. And I'm sure a lot of people there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so thank you so much for this. No yes. problem. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, anyone who needs your contact, rest assured, I'll I'll hand it over to them. So. All right. Cool. No problem, Fred. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll thank talk you. To Have you a later. good day. Yeah. Okay. Bye. You too.